Good evening to you all, and thank you all for coming. And especially thanks to our uh, guest tonight, Dr. Susan George, um, of whom, well, I, I must say that it's uh, it's really one can see that Susan is uh, uh, a global uh, seasoned activist. Uh, for for the causes she defends, and the way I mean, the, she facilitates for any person the, the the task of introducing her. I mean, on her website, there's a very detailed, short, long, whatever you you want. I mean, all sizes of, uh, of bio and all that, with uh, even recommendations. I noted the one saying that I am not an economist. Right. <laughs> I am not an economist. She is, uh, Susan is not an economist. Susan George has academic degrees, I will read here, in French and government, in philosophy, and a, a PhD in uh, political studies uh, in, uh, in France, in Paris. And, well, uh, Susan is uh, mostly known through her uh, books and her uh, activities in the, uh, in the global justice uh, movement. Uh, well, I'll read, although, I mean, <clears throat> I mean because it's, uh, it's uh, how to say, it's uh, quite convenient to have the presentation ready for, for a presenter like myself. Uh, she's the author of 14 books written in French and English and widely translated in very many languages. Susan George is president of the board of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam, which she describes as a decentralized fellowship of scholars living throughout the world and whose work is intended to contribute to social justice and who are active in civil society in their own countries, which is definitely the case for Susan George uh, for the country where she is based, that is France. She's uh, presently honorary president of ATTAC, France ATTAC, for those among you who know about the history of the global justice movement, the, the, the World Social Forums and all that, ATTAC is the organization that played the key role in setting all this um, uh, on. And uh, ATTAC, which is the acronym for Association for Taxation, well, in, Fran in French, but the translation would be Association for Taxation of Financial Transaction to, to aid citizens. Uh, well, not exactly the translation, but uh, this is the meaning. Perfect. Anyway, that's perfect. Um, and she, before that, before being honorary president, Susan was the vice president between '99, so very early, very early <coughs> stage uh, beginnings of attack until mid uh, 2006. And she's also a member of the scientific council of the same organization. Now. Uh, 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 she, she, I mean, she's the author of very, very many, many books, and I mean, from early titles uh, were bestsellers in their, in their kind, like uh, How the Other Half Dies, The Real Reasons for World Hunger, which was published in 76, and which I'm mentioning because it is available for free download on uh, Susan's uh, uh, website, uh, the webpage. You have, you have it on the announcement. Of, uh, of this, uh, this lecture. Uh, uh, Well-known titles like uh, A Fate Worse Than Debt, uh, 1987 book, The Debt Boomerang, uh, 1992, uh, uh, and among her uh, most recent books, you have uh, Hijacking America, How the Religious and Secular Right Change What Americans Think, and this was published in 2008, so quite recent, and already translated into several languages. Uh, we the Peoples of Europe, a book that came out also in the same year, 2008. Uh, another world is possible if, important, uh, well, the, the whole book is in the if, which is a discussion of the possibility of the world, and this was published here, uh, I mean, here in New York by Verso, in 2004. Uh, uh, and many other other books that you can find on on the uh, the web page uh, that uh, I mentioned so without further delay I give uh, the guest to our very distinguished uh, guest the floor to our very distinguished guest and thank you very much
Thank you very much indeed, Gilbert, for asking me. I'm always flattered when I, if I'm asked to such a prestigious institution as SOAS, I always feel flattered and honored and a little bit scared because I'm not really an academic. I'm, I am a scholar activist. I do try to get my research right and to, and to use it for the benefit of, of people everywhere, but I'm not an academic, and I suppose I'm a little bit jealous of academics in some way, or I think they're a special kind of human, you know, up there. So I'm very flattered and honored to be here, and I'm grateful to Gilbert also for organizing this series, because I think, you know, none of us know enough about globalization, and none of us can get enough different perspectives on it, so I'm sure that the other uh, talks in this series have been valuable, and I hope that mine will be too. Um, well, what I want to talk about, the title is Breaking Up from Crisis into a Green and Just World, and what I would like to do is typically French, you will recognize it, three parts. Um, what's the nature of the crisis? What are the remedies? And finally, is it possible to apply these remedies? And the first two parts, I think, are very empirical, very practical, uh, not an enormous amount. I mean, maybe I'll make some mistakes, and you should tell me if I do. But I think mostly there's not a huge amount of discussion about those parts, or at least I haven't seen any, or I would have incorporated them. But there's a lot of discussion about the last part. Is it possible to apply the remedies that I will try to outline? So I'll try to go as fast as I can, because this is the first time I've given this particular talk, which is in fact a resume of a future book, which is going to be published sometime this year, and I don't know exactly when yet, but which will be called Their Crises, Our Solutions. And I like the kind of us and them, because I think the us and them is becoming, becoming ever more distinct um, those who are profiting from the crisis are a tiny minority, and, but we, when I say we, I realize I abuse this pronoun all the time, but when I say we, I mean the kinds of decent, honest, thoughtful people that I meet all the time, and like the people in this room. And, and, and the ones that I think are prime candidates for doing something about the mess uh, in the world. So I do use the pronoun we, and forgive me if you think it, I'm being abusively including you, but that's what I'm going to do this evening, and you can, um, then you can do what you like with it. Um, so the problem is going to be, is it possible to apply these remedies? So, uh, what's the nature of the crisis? Well, first of all, it's not a crisis. Everybody's now accepted this word, but if you look for the definitions of crisis, you will see that it comes from the Greek. It means a decision. The, the root is for is decision making. And a crisis is a moment, it's a crossroads, it's a moment where you go from either you go towards death or you go towards recovery in, in medicine. In classical drama, it's the moment where the Gordian knot is cut and the, uh, the rest of the, the play uh, is going to be the playing out of that, uh, of, of cutting that Gordian knot. In Chinese, I asked um, a, a sinologist, uh, because very often you hear people say, well, in Chinese, the, the word for crisis is a combination of danger and opportunity. And I said, is that true? And he said, no, not really. It's more of an occidental construct uh, on the Chinese character, which he says is more like the trigger of the arbalet uh, that, that you are going to stretch and then you, you the launch whatever the missile is. And that is, that's what the character for crisis is. So in Chinese, in Greek, uh, in whatever language, possibly others, here I'm sure you speak, there are many people who speak many other languages. I'd be interested to hear how you define crisis and where it comes from in your language. But uh, this isn't a crisis because it's chronic. And I'm just going to go very quickly through 
um, a series of, of crises that have occurred only um, since the early 1980s, and I'll just list them because you will see that these crises are getting closer and closer together. And I would argue that we are more often in a state of what people call crisis than we are in what others would call a normal period. So, 1982, you have the Mexican debt crisis when Mexico declares a default. There's a huge emergency meeting in in uh, New York and a solution is found and uh, the debt crisis is still not over. As, as everybody knows, from Mexico it goes all over the world and it becomes a kind of permanent crisis for the South. 1985-86, you have the savings and loan crisis in the United States, which also continues for several years. There are 745 failures of savings and loans, which are like British building societies, with a bill for the government which comes to $130 billion that the US government forks out to save these institutions. Meanwhile, a few Texas and, and other southern investors become very, very rich, uh, having in, incited this crisis. 1987. On October 19th, the Dow Jones stock index goes down by 23% in a single day, unprecedented event. Uh, and a trillion dollars in paper wealth on the stock market is wiped out uh, overnight, and then this spreads to other markets. This did not go very far, and there was quite a quick recovery. But it was still seen as a total disaster at the time. 1990. Japan is struck by crisis, and that is still going on 20 years later. Japan's economy has never emerged from that initial event. Well, the 1990s were, although perhaps in the North we don't always remember this, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, has made a list of 90 crises that took place in countries from Algeria to Zambia in the south, where uh, the currencies were attacked, speculation against the, um, the currency, and they define a serious crisis by a drop in the value of at least 35% in the space of two months. And there were 90 of these throughout the decade. They, they measure between 1990 and 2002. But these are all over the world. And then, of course, this culminates in totally visible crises in Asia, starting with Thailand and then South Korea, Indonesia. I remember I happened to be in Thailand while these crises were spreading through Asia like wildfire. And the headlines of the Bangkok Post said 35,000 bank employees sacked in Indonesia this week. Uh, people were losing their jobs right and left. Trade absolutely stopped because no one would leave the goods on the, on the pier unless they had been paid in cash. Um, the people were, were committing suicide because they lost their jobs and they had no way of feeding their families. This was serious business and then this spread into uh, Latin America, to Turkey, uh, to Russia. Um, this went all over the world. Um, so these major currency crises were extremely serious and should have been uh, a warning. Then back to the United States, 2001. Enron, you probably remember the name, um, it had lied about its debts and about its profits. It had $25 billion in debt that it had never uh, owned up to, and it had understated uh, what its liabilities were, but it had opened nearly 700 subsidiaries in the Cayman Islands so that all of these things could be hidden very carefully and very cleverly from view. But that collapsed, and that simply took away all the pensions from a whole um, well, from thousands of employees after having blacked out most of the West Coast of the United States. And then, of course, as we approach our own time, 2001, 2002, the crisis of Silicon Valley, the dot-com bubble, 
which collapses and a lot of, of stocks which were being heavily invested in are shown to be absolutely worthless. And then uh, in 2007, the subprime crisis starts. So I'm just trying to convince you that we are not in a crisis. We are in a chronic situation. And I don't believe that this particular crisis, since that is now the standard term, uh, is at all over. I think we are going towards something which will be uh, much worse because uh, since the same causes produce the same effects and since we are literally giving money to the banks now, they can borrow at practically zero percent and lend out at three or four or five percent. You don't have to be a genius to make money under those conditions and they are now going exactly back to their old ways except with a couple of twists. The nicest twist that I have seen is that now, because there's no longer any point in speculating on subprimes, uh, because all those people practically have been turfed out of their homes. Last year, well, in 2008 already, 2.8 million families were thrown out onto the street from their homes, which they had hoped um, they were trying to participate in the American dream. Uh, and, and, and lost um, to the sharks. And last year it was worse, it was 3.2 million and there will be many, many more uh, again this year. I don't know how many, but this is still going on. So there's no point in speculating on, uh, on packages of loans. These, these are what I call the toxic sausages because what the banks do is take a whole lot of different kinds of debt. They put them, they can be student loan debts. You know, in the US, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here in the US most of, if you were in the US, most of you, because you would have had to borrow at least $100,000 to come to SOAS for two or three years. So it, it's pretty hard, you know, you spend 15 years paying back, which is why people try to go into lucrative jobs, because the, the, the kids in the US can't, uh, they can't join an NGO, they can't work for nothing, they have their student loan to pay off. So anyway, student loans, automobile loans, credit card loans, many people in the US have six to seven credit cards which are really revolving funds where they're charged very high interest but they can get, uh, they can renew them by paying back one and then the other and so on. And then of course, the mortgage loans and all of those mixed together in a great cauldron and pulled out and rolled up and then cut into slices and put into packages of toxic sausages which nobody except a very few people in the bank itself know uh, what's in them. But these were sold uh, all over the world because they were given very high ratings. This is, I'm, if I start on this story, we'll be here at midnight, so I'm going to stop there. But um, we are going back into other bubbles. And the bubble I wanted to tell you about, which I think is particularly nauseating, is that the banks are now buying up insurance policies from chronically ill and old people who are selling their insurance policies because they need the cash, because otherwise they could not get health care. So let's say you have a policy which is a life policy which is worth a million dollars, and you will sell it to the bank for 400000 400, and the bank will mix up, this time not student, car, credit card, and house loans, but Alzheimer's, cancer, um, diabetes, um, you know, whatever. And that's what they're making the loans out of. So they dose the diseases, and then they sell these on as packages, and it's better if the people die earlier rather than later because then the return is going to be much greater uh, to those who buy these loans. This seems to be the new, the new thing with the banks. I've only seen one serious article about it, but I think it's, uh, I think it's definitely uh, the kind of things th th these banks would do. And we ha are going to have probably a bubble in government paper. You can't issue bonds continually. Goldman Sachs taking a commission, by the way, on every one of them. Goldman Sachs is now making $100 million, not 
a month, not a week, but a day, $100 million a day for Goldman Sachs, and a lot of that comes from marketing government paper. There's not, it's not a government agency that markets the bonds. It's a private investment bank, and now that Lehman Brothers has failed, there's less competition, and Goldman Sachs is on easy street. Now, we could tell stories about them, too. Uh, okay, the, anyway, it's not a crisis. There's going to be more bubbles, and we are in a continuum of uh, financial wrongdoing which is legal and which is going to continue because there is a great deal of money to be made doing it, for some. And second, it's not just financial, although finance has moved practically everything else uh, off the front pages. But if you look at what kind of world we are living in now, this neoliberal world, these 30 years of neoliberalism, which began here with Margaret Thatcher and in the US with Ronald Reagan in 1979-80, and so they've had 30 years. That's what this book called Hijacking America was about, changing what Americans think making everybody believe that private is always better than public, that the market always knows best, that the market will always make wise decisions, and so on. Well, these, have, these policies have done exactly what they were intended to do. And what they were intended to do was to concentrate money at the top and to make sure that everyone uh, that was not at the top was in an extremely precarious uh, position. There have been enormous gains for capital over these past 30 years, not just through privatization, although that has been, I don't even call it privatization, I call it alienation, because what it amounts to is handing over the result of the work of hundreds if not thousands of people over decades and just taking the result of all of that work and giving it to private capital. And there was a great, you know, hue and cry that actually the employees were profiting from this in the various British industries, British gas uh, and so on, that were, that were um, privatized. But in fact, the employees of these companies never bought more than 1% of all the stock. It was always the very large investors that profited from these marketings of, of previously uh, public companies. And once deregulation starts, and once you stop taxing rich people, naturally the state is less in a position uh, to provide public services, and therefore it has a good argument for uh, if public services are de become more uh, problematic, degraded. There's a good excuse for privatizing them. And when you don't get deregulation automatically, you pay for it. That's what the banks did in the United States. They spent $5 billion over a couple of decades, and they got a dozen regulations utterly removed by the Congress. They lobbied for it. And the most important one that they got rid of, which we will, well, there are two very important ones, but the one that I speak of now that we will go back to was called the Glass-Steagall Act. Is that a familiar term to you? Yeah, some of you. What that did, it was named after, it was one of the first measures passed in the New Deal of 1933, and what it did was to separate the commercial banks, that is to say the retail banks, where you deposit your salary and you write checks and you have a debit card on that account, from the investment banks, the Goldman Sachs, the Lehman's, uh, the Bear Stearns, et cetera. And separating those meant that it would be impossible for the investment bank to serve its, you know, to, to grab the money, uh, serve, is that not what I meant, to sell here, uh, to, you know, to take the money in private accounts and use that for their own trading accounts. And it was very important to keep these two functions separate because as soon as they got rid of this act, and that's a long and interesting 
saga, how they did it, with Citicorp at the forefront of the effort, um, as soon as they were able to do it, they became what is now known as too big to fail, but not too big to bail. Too big to fail because suddenly investment banks, commercial banks, insurance, all kinds of financial services were able to come together and be housed under a single roof and under a single label on the stock market. And the banks made absolutely enormous profits. And the financial sector assumed an importance which had, it had never had before. In the 1950s, half of all bank loans in the United States went to what is called the real economy, where actual goods and services are produced and distributed. And the investment came from the banking system and half of it went to the real economy. And now over 80% of all bank loans go to the financial sector. So it's a completely incestuous circuit. The banks are financing the financial sector. And contrary to what Marx said, who would, I think, be appalled if he were to return, you don't go from commodities and actual production and sales and investment and profit and reinvestment in actual things and actual machinery and workers that you exploit, of course, but you don't bother with all of that. You go from money to money to money to money. And you can sell the same house six times, and each time with a profit. And you can put the same house in a, in a mixture, in a toxic sausage, six times and sell it on. And each time, uh, you're, you're going to be making money. And, and that is exactly what the banks have managed to do. But it's not that simple either, because it's not just that they were able to get this deregulation, but it's also uh, how they were able to wipe out many, many social gains that had been made uh, after the war, particularly during the New Deal and then especially after the war, not just in the US, but also in Britain and in continental Europe. And just to give you a few, uh, I'm not going to drown you in figures, but just a few figures uh, that the European uh, value added the way it was divided, in 1974, labor was getting 74% of the value added in economic activity in a year, and therefore capital was getting 26%. And 30 years later, now, it is capital is getting 40%, not 26, and labor is getting 60, not 74. Now, this isn't trivial. Those are figures for, the, for Europe. Economists like to have arguments about whether that's accurate or not. I, I use that one, but you can, let's say it's only 10 points of change, because I haven't seen any serious estimates under that, that labor is now has 10 points less of value added and capital has 10 points more. This is not small change, right? This is, we are talking about the entire GDP of Europe which is something like $13,000 billion. So we're talking $1.3 trillion that has been, or $1.3,000 billion that has been taken out of the pocket of labor and put into the, into the pockets of capital. So this, is, this isn't trivial. I've got to go faster because I can. So that's one consequence because when you, when you change the destination, that means less invested in the real economy, that means fewer jobs, that means overproduction, and it means that people are simply not able uh, to live at the standard of living that they were able to live at before. In the US, they did it slightly differently. They simply allowed wages to stagnate and the labor unions were too weak to do anything about it. But this has resulted in unprecedented levels of inequality, unprecedented since the 1920s in any case. I highly recommend to you to get a sense of what inequality means and why it is important to read Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett's book, which is called The Spirit Level. I don't like the title very much, but what it means is a spirit level is how you measure if a wall is straight or not, you know, or a floor is straight. And, and they show that not only uh, how, how much the 
how much the balance has changed, but they show that the countries with the greatest inequalities are also those with the greatest prison populations, the high, highest number of mental illness cases, the most uh, problematic children uh, with, with psychiatric complications, the most obesity, uh, it goes on and on. Um, and, and so these things are very expensive to, to society in general, and people no longer trust each other, and social cohesion is lost. And I am sorry to say that not only is the US always out on the frontiers of inequality, but it is always closely trailed uh, by Great Britain. So I, I ask you to read that book because I can't go into detail here. But it's not only that capital has been enriching itself in the North, uh, in the South we now have quite firm evidence that there have been transfers out of sub-Saharan Africa of at least $420 billion over the 30 years starting in about 1974, which with interest would come to over $600 billion, most of this coming from loans and grants that were being brought in via the World Bank, the IMF, various national countries, uh, and most of it uh, sent back to tax havens and private accounts. 60% of it left the same year that it arrived in Africa. There are other studies which say that the figures are much higher, but everywhere the elites have been able to profit from, the, um, uh, from, from deregulation and from lax uh, regulation and from also simply the fact of globalization. So that the inequality crisis, I think, is, is reaching uh, unheard of levels. Another crisis is of the basic necessities of food and water for tens of millions of people. Uh, in, 19, in, in, sorry, in 2008, an, another 100 million people were plunged into hunger because of the huge increase in food prices now that had various causes, it's never unicausal, but most of the causes were, the heaviest ones, were the investment in agrifuels, substituting good agricultural land not to produce crops but to pr produce ethanol for automobiles. One tank full for one SUV is equivalent to feeding one person a decent diet uh, for a year. Uh, and that is where one-third of the corn land in the United States has been uh, transferred. So in, uh, in 2008, there were food riots, or what people locally call them, movements against expensive basics um, in 30 different countries. And that is also unprecedented, because usually in history, famine and really serious hunger episodes would take place locally. You could say it happened here and it happened for very specific local reasons, either political or climatic, but no. Bangladesh and Bolivia don't have very much in common culturally or economically. And this happened in 30 different places. And water is becoming much scarcer also because of global warming. The glaciers are disappearing. Uh, who knows what Bolivians are going to drink when the Andean glaciers have melted. All of this is going much faster uh, than was foreseen. Uh, climate change is going to increase conflict. It is going to influence refugees. What we see now as migration is going to be minuscule compared to the numbers of people who will be trying to escape from impossible conditions where they are, because <coughs> we already know that where things are already dry, they will become drier, and where they are humid, they will become more so. So more floods on one side, more uh, droughts on another, more deserts, and uh, the movement of people is going to accelerate. It is already starting in some places. They begin by trying to go somewhere else in their own country or to a neighboring country, but there they, they have problems and they will, so there is going to be a vast movement 
of people attempting to reach Europe. And they will try because, as we have seen, they risk their lives and very often lose their lives trying to come to Europe. Now, I think this is largely due to European policies, but that would be another subject, and it's not the one of, of this evening. So food, water, extreme weather events, these are all going to multiply, and over all of this looms climate disaster, which is provoking more conflicts already, but will provoke uh, far more in, in the future. And I think the climate disaster and the, what happened in Copenhagen is the most serious of all because if you make an enormous effort, sometimes you can go back and start over where politics and social choices are concerned. You could fix inequality with an enormous effort politically and socially, but you can't do that with climate. Once it's off the chart, it's off the chart, and that's it, and you can say, I'm very sorry, but uh, James Hansen, who is the, probably the most well-known climatologist in the world, he's a driving force in the IPCC, he has just written a book. He's the man who has always said glaciers are melting faster than we thought. Uh, Antarctica and the Arctic and the permafrost in the Arctic are melting faster than we thought. And now he has published a book, which the review in The New Scientist, I haven't read the book itself, but the review a couple of weeks ago in The New Scientist says this is the most terrifying book you are ever going to read. And Hansen thinks that if that the governments are all lying and if, that if something is not done soon, the oceans at one point are going to start to boil and there will be no chance. I'm not speaking about civilized life on Earth. I'm talking about life on Earth, period. That's the way he sees it. So we've got a crisis of, of justice. The guilty are being rewarded. The innocent are being punished through unemployment, through... Uh, um, all kinds of hardships. Uh, the European Union is going to be among the hardest hit places in the world in terms of increases in unemployment. That comes from the ILO. A crisis of hunger, a crisis of climate, of conflicts, um, etc. So we are in a kind of concentrated moment where all these crises are converging and are making each other worse. So, finally, I've got to point, the second point, and I must go faster. Um, what are the remedies? Well, their remedies, I think, are um, totally inadequate. The G20, this self-proclaimed world government, um, is, is um, not up to the task. And I'm sorry to say that the fact that the BRICS have joined doesn't seem to change anything. I get the impression that the BRIC people are so delighted to be at the table with the G8 that they are just shivering with, with pleasure and, and, and they're not making any, any noises and they are in the same league. And the same league means we are looking for business as usual as soon as we can get back to the usual. So what they've done is to give the IMF, which was at death's door, $750 billion without any conditions. The IMF can use that just the way it used the, its money over the 70s, 80s, and 90s, which is to do, say creating tremendous hardship. Um, they've made the World Bank the head of the clean development mechanism and of all sorts of environmental, the, the World Bank is the head of the environmental department for the, for the G20, and this is also not just ludicrous but tragic because the World Bank Group continues with its private arm, the International Finance Corporation, to lend massively to coal and oil and gas projects. It has lent um, in the most recent um, survey by the Institute for Policy Studies $8 billion to fossil fuel projects. This is the last institution that should be allowed to have um, a hand in anything to do with climate. It's giving the fox the keys to the hen house. And um, the, they've made some, some gestures about tax havens, but these too have been ridiculous because 
What happened at the first one was that they had a list of the OECD countries that were supposed to be dirty countries. They were not complying. And suddenly, four days after that G8 meeting in April of last year, all those countries were off the list. Well, they hadn't been really the most serious tax havens to begin with. Uruguay, uh, the Philippines, a couple of others. But they're not the G8. Uh, th there's a long story about that. But the G8 is not doing anything serious uh, about climate change. And as for bailing out the banks with our money, the estimates go from 5,000 billion to 14,000 billion. And I take 14 because that comes from a couple of researchers at the Bank of England, and that, I think, is a fairly credible source. Uh, the figures that they presented at a conference organized by the Federal Reserve of Chicago in the US, and they, they put the savings of, ba I mean, the bailouts of banks and other enterprises for the pound, the dollar, and the euro at $14 trillion. Now, um, some of that has been paid back, but this crisis is definitely not over for people. Uh, the unemployment, I mean, I've mentioned this, but you can all see why this isn't the case. And what's more, the banks aren't lending. They are not lending to small and medium-sized businesses, to householders, and so on. They're often hoarding the cash. So what would be genuine, genuine remedies? Well, the way I see things now, uh, the world as it is organized, if you look at it in terms of concentric circles, you have the outer circle, the most powerful and important one is labeled finance. Then there's a circle inside that that represents the real economy, but it's finance that's dominating the real economy. And inside of those two, you have society, but it's finance and the economy that are dictating to society how it must be organized, not the other way around. And finally, the least important of all and the smallest is the biosphere, is the planet which is, for conventional economics, the place where we get our raw materials and the place we throw away our greenhouse gases and our other rubbish. But that's all it is, and that is the way it is still treated by conventional economics and therefore by most of the governments of the world. So what would be real remedies? What I'm going to say is entirely practical. This is not uh, utopian. These are not impossible things to do. These are things that are, for which the plans exist, for which we know how to do, which specialists can tell you exactly how to write the software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, first of all, I think we have to have regulation. Of course, everybody agrees on better regulation now. For example. Uh, Putting back the Glass-Steagall Type Act into place, yes, of course. I don't think derivatives should be allowed, but there are a lot of sober people who think derivatives can play a useful role. I'm not going to elaborate on the, on the regulation. But um, best of all, I mean, if citizens everywhere have spent five to take the low figure to $14,000 billion, that money has not come out of the air. That is coming out of our pockets, out of our futures, our children, our grandchildren, and this is going to go on for a long time. And it's not only coming in direct money in taxes, it's also coming in terms of public services not supplied, of unemployment compensation not supplied, of jobs not provided, etc., uh, etc. Et so I would like you to make a small effort, which will make me feel great if you don't mind doing it. Because when I came to the demo in, uh, against the G8, the G20 uh, last year on March 31st, I got this huge crowd in Hyde Park to say it with me. And I'd like you to say it with me now. The banks are ours. Would you just please say that? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
thank you. That sounds so good, because it's true, you know, it really is true. They are ours, and you've got to get used to saying that. Um, so we should socialize them. They should become public utilities. They should be forced to lend, at least in part, because you maybe can't take over if they haven't been bailed out, but certainly enough of them have been bailed out that you could take them over squarely and fairly and say, okay, now you are going to lend to small and medium enterprise that's got a green project. We already know there's lots of studies that show that green jobs uh, are, um, you can create a lot more jobs through green projects which are not delocalizable and they are jobs for a high skills, highly paid, highly successful economy. So f first priority, small and medium enterprise that's got a green project. Better still, one that's got a green and social project or a social project, meaning one in which the workers have an interest other than just working there and earning a salary. By that I mean, uh, and I was going to tell you the story of Lucas Aerospace, but for those of you who are too young ever to have heard of Lucas Aerospace, look it up. It's a wonderful story, but with a very sad ending. It's a story in 1974 and years beyond of workers figuring out how to produce socially useful things in factories that were producing only armaments. At the time, even 30 years ago, they invented fantastically ecological goods and social, socially useful goods, medical technology, and then it w the, the thing was killed, but that is the kind of ideal I mean. Don't bail out General Motors and Opel and whatever the company is here that's being bailed out. Pay the workers for two years to make their own plan. What could we produce with the same people, the same knowledge, the same skills, and the same machinery? Surely we could use much more democracy in, in our enterprises, and there's no reason that democracy should stop at the door of the economy. Democracy is not just something which is for politics only, and then hopefully for politics, not even there always, and then maybe, you know, one day the economy. No, we could do that right away. And second priority, of course, the to go to the um, uh, to, to householders who want to refit their houses or have solar panels in their roofs. You know, in Britain, uh, there are builders who know exactly how to build energy neutral buildings. And Tony Blair refused, they, the, these builders asked to have a building code which would make them competitive because their product is 10 or 15 percent more expensive at the outset, except you never have another energy bill in your whole life. But Blair refused to do that. Uh, that seems to me not a very wise decision. And we should be helping people and helping companies that want to build in a green way. Um, now, how to pay? Lots of people say, well, all of this is all very well. Yes, we would like to have a Green New Deal. That's another thing you should read is the Green New Deal by the New Economics Foundation. Uh, I could go into great detail on that. This is something I think is the big plan. It's to do what Franklin Roosevelt did, but to do it green. And our politicians have talked about this a little, and Obama has a very small one, and Sarkozy has a very small one, but we need to do this 100% for the relaunching of the economy. Well. Uh, how to pay, because governments say to us, well, this is all very well, these are excellent ideas, but uh, we can't afford it because we've just had to bail out the banks, etc. That is nonsense. We can perfectly well afford it. We can tax people who are no longer taxed at all. Under the Republican presidency of Dwight Eisenhower in the United States, the top tax bracket was taxed at 90%. Today, it's 35, because we've spent the last 30 years reducing taxes on the rich. And I wish I had time to tell you about Merrill Lynch's World Wealth Report, which even after the crisis had identified what it calls high net worth individuals, 
and ultra high net worth individuals who have between one and 30 million and up to play around with in liquid money. And there are 8.6 million of those people in the world, that's smaller than Greater London. And together they have 38 trillion dollars, 38,000 billion dollars, which is three times the GDP of the European Union or the United States. It's uh, 12 times the GDP of India, and that belongs to 8.6 million people who are almost not taxed at all because they are the kind who can make, take advantage of tax havens uh, and of all kinds of advice so that they are not um, subject to the same taxes as everyone else who has a fixed address and is identifiable. So that means tax those people and above all close down the tax havens where the lowest estimate of how, how much is stashed is about $12,000 billion, which means at least $250 billion a year in lost revenues for governments. I think we should fi finally solve the debt crisis once and for all by exchanging total debt cancellation <coughs> for reforestation and bioconservation in the South. Forests are the best absorbers of CO2. I don't see why we can't pay people through local communities where they are to replant trees where they already live. And in exchange, the government should be getting debt relief. And it shouldn't get debt relief unless it accepts bioconservation. Um, when we started on the debt campaigns, the Jubilee 2000 campaigns and all of that, and made a great human chain in Birmingham in 1998, um, at that point, the HIPICs, the highly indebted poor countries, owed 102 billion. Now they owe 100 and billion and some. So the reduction over 10 years has been 1.4%. Now this, who do they think they're kidding? They were promising debt relief in 1998 and virtually nothing has happened. So let's do this once for all. And we could issue Euro bonds. We have a central bank in Europe that does nothing except control inflation. It should be like a normal central bank issuing bonds for big green infrastructure projects that no country can do by itself, even the richest ones. And we should change the rules of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, because if we don't, and we continue to go with the intellectual property agreement called TRIPS, uh, then poorer countries are never going to get green technology because they will have to pay through the nose for 20 years. So those are just a few practical suggestions, which I don't think are utopian, take a lot of political effort, of course, because the bankers always protest and always say, but this will change, you know, this will bring down civilization as we know it, if we have to pay one per thousand on a currency tax, or I mean, there's all kinds of taxes you can invent. At ATTAC, we like the one on currency trades, but this should also apply to any other kind of financial products. The, you know, Keynes, Keynes and his younger colleague, Roy Harrod, used to like to go out and get drunk together and invent new taxes. And I think we, we could really use Keynes and Harrod today you know, and invent new taxes. But carbon taxes and various things like that, because there's plenty of money out there. Don't let anyone tell you that there isn't. So, a uh, big problem here, and here's where I ask for your input, is it possible to apply these remedies and bring about real change, wh whereas we know that real change is absolutely urgent? Um, well, this is the question that I ask myself all the time, and I don't really know how to answer it. Um, I, obviously, the question is, can one do all of this under capitalism? And my temperament says, well, no. Probably not, um, but my hope 
says, well, there's got to be another way because I don't see a one-off uh, destruction of capitalism. I really don't see it. I hope if some of you see it, you will tell me where it is. You will tell me where is the Winter Palace today. Uh, you will tell me what is the name of the Tsar and where can we go uh, in order to, to, to overthrow this, this domination. But I, I honestly don't see it. I, I would like to, but uh, so if you say, well, no, you can't overthrow uh, capitalism and therefore the planet is going to go to hell and all of this inequality will continue and people will continue to suffer needlessly and so on. Well, that's despair to me and I'm, I'm not into despair. So I think, you know, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't the money so we have to think as one of your finance ministers said a while ago. Well, we haven't, we haven't the way to get rid of capitalism so we've got to think. Um, and, and what I try to think about is, um, is how can we organize and how can we bring about such force among people who have always been the driving force in any kind of change in the world so that um, we can make progress and that we can say the, the history of human emancipation is not over. And it seems to me that the only way to do that is through much broader alliances, through much better popular education, and that um, although the state has been very largely privatized, and Europe is a particular problem there, um, democracy is the only answer. And sometimes I do take heart from the fact that 10 years ago, uh, we were nowhere. Ten years ago was, was Seattle, 1999. Nobody, people didn't know each other. The activists in Europe didn't know the ones in the US who didn't know those in Asia, who didn't know those in Latin America. Now we know each other. There's been ten years of social forums. There have been alliances created. There are international edu uh, organizations. Via Campesina, the farmers organization, small farmers organization with over 50 branches around the world is probably the most successful. But there are a lot of others. There's the Tax Justice Network. ATTAC is active in continental Europe, in Africa, and in several countries in Latin America. And we tend to have good contacts. We have trade networks also of people who meet each other when the WTO has a ministerial or when there's another big um, er emergency in the area of trade. So there has been progress. And perhaps the only good thing that came out of Copenhagen was that now I think what we call the social movements, which are pretty much labor and, and um, people fighting for less inequality and more employment and so on, but the social movement, anti-racism, anti-discrimination anti, um, um, movements and so on, um, I think now the junction has been made with the ecological movements, which wasn't the case before. In Seattle, we said, Teamsters and Turtles united at last. The Teamsters, you know, that's the truckers union in the, in the US. And the turtles were there because they were being destroyed by certain uh, practices, I mean, a decision of the WTO to allow uh, people to fish without putting turtle excluder devices on their boats. And there were pro protesters to save the turtles, and the Teamsters were in the same demonstration. And the banner was Teamsters and Turtles United at Last. But it wasn't really true. And now I think it is true. I think the environmentalists and the social movements and labor movements have understood that we all need each other. And none of us, special interest groups, can succeed alone. In other words, farmers by themselves cannot change land tenure and agricultural problems. And unions by themselves cannot change labor issues completely. And, and, and and succeed. Women by themselves cannot obtain all of the other gains that the feminist movement needs to obtain. 
and so on. So we have to come together. It's the same for the ecologists by themselves. They cannot win on issues like Copenhagen. So all I can say is that the goal ought to be to change the order of those circles that I described and make sure that climate is at the outside because that is the real constraint. If we don't get that right, everything else will be wrong. So climate should be the big constraint at the outside. And then society, which ought to be free democratically to decide how it wants to be organized. And those organizations will be different according to different histories, different cultures, different, um, different levels of struggle also. But society should be the driving force that says, and we will have, in order to do these things, an economy that works in such and such a way. And then finance would be just the last smaller circle, a tool in the service of the economy, but not the master anymore. So I hope that if we are able to do some of these things, and I see many young people becoming interested in, in joining these movements. Don't ask me what can I do, just join something. Pick an aspect of the crisis. I've tried to give a capsule version of many of these various crises. Take an aspect that interests you most and do it well and build alliances. Another big stepping stone we've got to make is to bring the peace movement into all of this. It is still very much separate from the social ecological movement. And that would be a major advance if we could, because there's lots of group wor groups working on peace and conflict issues, and we don't know them and they don't know us. So those are just a few suggestions um, about how we might build more resilience into our societies, because if we don't do that, pretty fast, and if our economy is always going towards higher, faster, bigger, taller, uh, more money, more, more everything, it's, we're stretching the elastic to the point that it's going to break. And I would rather not live through the next crisis, so we should all get organized to get rid of this one. Thank you very much.